Good morning. Welcome. Glad you can join us. I'm going to wait a minute or two here for people to be rolling in, but uh, appreciate you joining us this morning for the Crossroads webinar. There we go. People rolling in now. Give another moment here before we get started. Glad you're here. For those of you uh, in Minnesota, it looks like we're having our second winter coming back this week. Hope you're prepared. I was thinking might actually have a chance to use my snowblower for a second time only this winter, which is amazing. <laughs> well, I'll get started. My name is Harry Urschel. I lead Minnesota Crossroads Career Network, and I'm glad you can join us this morning. We've got uh, some great content for you. Uh, just to give you a sense is I uh, want to uh, do a little bit of an introduction here now and then uh, have a short video for you. And then we have uh, Will O'Brien, who you all came to see, is going to be telling you about how to work smarter and not harder in your job search. And I think that sounds great to anybody that uh, is is struggling in, through uh figuring out how to do this well. Um, I'm glad that uh, you are able to take advantage of the uh, this webinar, but there are many other things in Crossroads that I hope you take advantage of as well. And so after Will is done this morning, I encourage you to hang on just for another uh, few minutes for me to uh, share everything else that we offer through Crossroads so that you can get as much help as possible in your process. It's uh, I'm sure all of you have experienced the ups and downs already in terms of how this goes and nothing moves along as quickly as you hope it will. And so uh, we want to help you make it your time and effort in your job search as effective as possible and provide some uh, moral support along the way as well, because that can be half the battle sometimes is dealing with the uh, emotional challenges. Um, our hope with Crossroads is certainly to provide the best help and resources for your job search we, as we can, but also while pointing to the encouragement and hope of Jesus Christ. You know, many frustrations in our lives, especially in a job search, are when we don't get the things that we think we want. Sometimes it's even something we may have been praying for, like a specific job, and it doesn't come through. What I often forget is that God knows things that I don't know that he can see around corners that I can't see. As an example, say I'm walking down the street and come up on an intersection and the light turns green in my direction. And so I step off the curb to cross the street. In stepping down, I trip and fall. I'm upset and frustrated because I never trip like that. However, what I didn't know was that a speeding car was coming that ran through the red light. Had I stepped out onto the street, I would have been hit. Was that a fall a bad thing or a good thing? The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. The best way to think of that passage, actually, though, is that when you trust him with your life and committed to following him, he'll change the desires of your heart to be more in alignment with him and see things as he sees them. He wants the best for us. So sometimes when we don't get something we think we is good for us, like a particular job, he may be protecting us from something we don't know or can't see. We can be thankful for that. It doesn't feel like it sometimes that when we don't get what we want, but I encourage you to look at it from uh, perhaps the other perspective as well. Let me open with a word of prayer. We'll jump into the rest of the content for this morning. Lord, I pray that uh, you use this time for your purposes, that everyone here be encouraged today, that they hear from you in some way, that they get uh, some information that's helpful in their process and that uh, they walk away with new encouragement and, and hope in the uh, challenges they have ahead of them. Thank you for bringing everyone together. And we uh, just pray all this in Jesus name. Amen. Let me, uh, I've got a short video to share. Um, you know, when we hit speed bumps in life, whether it's uh, in our life otherwise, or in our career and or, or a job that we may lose, we wonder, you know, where did this come from and what's the purpose of this? Moralaki Atkinson is a gold medalist uh, uh, sprinter that had been in the Olympics and had uh, some challenges. So let me uh, share the screen here and um, give you a chance to, uh, to see that. Um, hang on.
I think I'm getting it. Here we go. They'd be like, she's really fast or she runs track. That was always the adjective or the description that came after the introduction of me. I liked being that person. And then all of a sudden it was completely stripped away from me and I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know who am I. Every training cycle is about figuring out how can I break my body. Texas sun, 100 degrees. If you put your hands or knees on the track, you'll probably get burned. You're crossing the finish line and your teammates are pulling you off the ground and then the next rep, you're pulling them off the ground. And then we strength train. A whole bunch of Olympic lifts, power cleans, box jumps, front squats, back squats, sled pulls. We push ourselves to the limit, breaking your body apart and coming back the next day and doing it over and over again. In 2016, when we were at the Olympic Games and we were running the prelim of the women's 4x100 relay, our second to third leg dropped the baton. I was standing there at the anchor leg waiting to receive a baton that was not coming to me. And in that moment, I had that thought of like, wow, I've trained what feels like your whole life for a moment that now seemed to be gone and stripped from me within the blink of an eye. So it takes you to a place of realizing that you have to make what you do worth it. As the story goes, we got to rerun and run by ourselves and we made the final and we came away with a gold medal in the 4x100 relay. I was ecstatic, I was on top of the world. But I was coming back to Austin, Texas, knowing that I wanted my life to look different. I didn't wanna be the same college girl, I didn't wanna keep being around those same group of people. I didn't want to keep partying. I didn't want to, to continue being that person. But I was also scared. I was scared of feeling alone and lonely and not having anyone and not knowing what I was going to do next. I got invited by my friend, Emmanuel Acho. He'd actually be mad at me for saying friend, by my best friend, Emmanuel Acho, to come to a game night. And I was hesitant at first and I was like, okay, I'll come to this game night. And I walked into a room full of people who were complete strangers to me, but that was going to become my new spiritual community, a community of people who have very little in common besides our love for game nights and our love for Jesus, who were going to become exactly what I needed. On January 27, 2018, at the end of a race, I ran into a wall stopping and completely ruptured my Achilles tendon. The Achilles is the strongest tendon in the human body and you need it to do literally everything. Walk, jump, crawl, climb stairs, stand up, sit down. I had it surgically repaired, but like I was being told, hey, you might never be the same runner that you were ever again. This may be a career ending injury for you. I was like angry at God at the sense of, I thought this is what I was supposed to be doing. And if this is what I'm supposed to be doing, then like, why did you take it away from me? My identity was built in track and field. All of a sudden it was completely stripped away from me and I didn't know who am I. I'm so independent and used to doing everything completely on my own. And I was at a point where I had to learn to ask for help. And that was, it was tough, but I was right where I needed to be. For the first time, I realized that I was surrounded by people who believed in me. And not only did they believe in me, they believed that God had a plan for my life and that he was still going to be faithful through it all. I'd never been in a place where every single one of my people that I hung out with and talked to were someone that I could also be like, hey, I need you to pray for this. And they actually would, not just say that they would. And it also made me realize that this is why we're supposed to live our lives together like this. So that when one person in your community is hurting or has fallen or can't fight their battle on their own, that you have 
10 or 15 or five or three or 25 people there who will step up and fight the battle for them that they can't fight for themselves. And that was the beginning of me really picking myself up and putting myself back together. Just because something happened that steered me away from what I thought was the path of least resistance doesn't mean that God changed, doesn't mean this plan for my life had changed, it just means that I had to go through a little bit of something first. I've realized that I've been in a tough situation that I didn't think that I could make it out of or I was so unsure about how I was gonna make it out of and I look back at it and I was like, wow, that was really easy and it was God's hand in all of it. Prior to my injury, I was always focused on breaking my body down, and now I had to focus on putting my body back together. When I get on the track, it's like, you did not wake up today to be mediocre. That's the talk that I'm giving to myself. You can do this, you only have one more rep. Take it every 50 meters. I wore my I am second bracelet. It would always just be there as like a, you're not doing this for you. This is not your thing that you're doing and like you have to keep going. I think the sweetest part of community is the ability to be vulnerable with people and let them see your true self and who you really are. And without Jesus Christ, I would not be who I am, I would not be where I am, and I would not be doing what I'm doing. Everything in my life has become solely because of who Jesus is and who he continues to be. My name is Morla K. Kennison and I am second. There we go. You know, it's, like I said, sometimes uh, in life we get knocked down and we wonder why and what's the purpose and how does we come through, how do we come through that? Sometimes uh, we don't realize uh, the what we've learned or what, uh, how we've grown or developed until after the fact, we don't necessarily see it when we're going through the difficult times. And, uh, it's usually in the difficult times of life that we grow. We don't, uh, grow a lot. Otherwise, I am glad to be able to introduce Will O'Brien. He, uh, is joining us this morning. We'll have a presentation for you that I know is going to be worthwhile and helpful for you in your job search. Will is the associate director and career coach for the Graduate Business Career Center at the uh, Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. He helps MBAs figure out what's next for themselves and coaches them how to find the right opportunities. And uh, most of the people that he works with are people that have returned to school. They're in their careers. They're not entry level. And so it's uh, very applicable to all the things that uh, we are doing with Crossroads as well. And so I'm I've known Will for a few years now and really appreciate uh, his heart to help other people, but uh, just the knowledge he's accumulated in his career services work for many years now. And so I'm glad to turn it over to him. Will, thanks for joining us and it's yours for the next hour. Thanks so much, Harry. Appreciate uh, the invite. And yes, working together with Harry over the years in various capacities, um, always been a fan and um so just so honored to be here today and be in this space. So um, today, the title of my presentation is Searching Smarter and Not Harder. Um, I am quickly racking up the years in working in career services, the career development space as a coach and a consultant. And um, there are things that as a career coach who does this on a daily basis, and hopefully you're doing these searches once, maybe every couple of years or not even that often. I see these things all the time. And there's some things that just, I get sad when I see, uh, 
job seekers doing that. And part of the reason is, is we've never been formally trained on how to job search. It's not a course that's a part of school or, or another part of life. And so um, I, I just want to be able to pass along some of the knowledge that I have from over the years and also be able to um, help you avoid some of the potholes that may get in the way of slowing down your search or doing some things that aren't going to have as good a return on your time investment. So I'm Will O'Brien. Like Harry said, I use he, him pronouns. I am a career consultant and coach and love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn and happy to connect with you uh, that way as well if you ever need to follow up. So a few extra things about me. So as Harry mentioned, I'm currently serving at the University of Minnesota. That is uh, my daytime job. I have been in career coaching spaces for over 15 years. I thought it would just be nice to show my career trajectory. I have had jobs before I moved to Minnesota. I had uh, jobs in other sectors. But once I got here to Minnesota and got my master's in counseling, I started working in university settings. So I started at North Central University and then moved on to Bethel University in a hybrid role of coaching and employer relations. From there, I was recruited away to recruit interns at Mortensen, a fantastic uh, construction company that does so much great here in the area, especially here at the U, building all of our lovely stadiums. Um, but then I moved on to Ramsey County Workforce Solutions. I worked with an entirely different population um, and had great experience there learning about serving um, people seeking all sorts of jobs in the community. Uh, but as I've gone through all these roles, I've learned what's the right fit for me. And working in a college setting is the right fit. And now I'm working with graduate students, which I absolutely love the highly motivated international and domestic students that I work with and watching them go into such amazing careers. Um, so that's that's a bit of my career pathway. Also been involved in a lot of different um, career development associations. Some of the things that are listed down there. I'm also highly active in um, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice and belonging. Um, activities here at Carlson and throughout the career community. Uh, we also joke here that I'm not only a coach of students, but also a coach of uh, my own students at home, uh, coaching soccer with my boys. And so um, those are some of the things that I do outside of the daily coaching. Also, active member at uh, Salem Covenant Church in New Brighton. So a little bit about my style is I may be different than some of the other monthly presenters in that I think of myself specifically as a job search expert. I do career coaching. I do help with um, things like, you know, career exploration, but I really think my bread and butter, my strengths is the years spent helping people to not once they figure out what they want to do, how to go out and find those jobs, how to execute those interviews, and how to work through negotiations. So those are some of the things I really focus on. I also listed down my styles, so just so you can get a little bit of a sense of me uh, by listing my Clifton strengths. Um, I think about these regularly. Uh, I actually listed six because I do embrace um, most of my top 10, uh, but these developer, futuristic, input, relator, empathy, analytical has never been technically in my top five, but I do like to highlight that that is a style that is quite uh, common in the day-to-day -day work that I do. So that's a little bit more about me. Happy to connect on LinkedIn uh, to stay in touch as well. So here's what I want to cover today, and then I'll get into the meat of the presentation. But essentially, want to talk a little bit about some opening remarks, but then move into some effective search tools that I highly recommend to all job seekers and work, especially with my students, on these um, two tools that come from different books. I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, I am a student of 
um, the career development space. I haven't done any original research myself, but highly, highly, highly recommend these four texts here. Uh, so the first one, uh, the most famous, most well-sold career book of all time, What Color Is Your Parachute? Um, by the famous uh, Dick Bowles. He uh, got me my start in learning about effective ways to job search, and I have thought about those principles ever since I first read this book. Um, you've, if you've been part of Crossroads for a while, uh, you may be familiar with this second book, the 20 Minute Networking Meeting book. I recommend this. This is probably my most recommended book. It is a fantastic and quick read or listen to. I mainly listen to the audio versions of these, but uh, to execute those highly effective job search methods of informational meetings or networking meetings. Um, the next two books are by the same author, Steve Dalton. I would say The Two-Hour Job Search is my second most recommended book because that is such a structured approach to job searching. Um, and then finally, his newest book, The Job Closure, it covers everything outside of the search book. Uh, so it's one that I've read more recently, but love the tips within that. It's broken into before the interview, during the interview, and after the interview is the three parts, and just such a great, rich text. And all of these, fortunately, since they're such widely publicized, are they're pretty cheap. Uh, they're available at most libraries. Um, and they've got great audio if you're a, a book listener. So I highly, highly, highly recommend these. And that's where most of my resources from today's presentation will come from. Okay, so as I mentioned, I did want to start with what are some of the things that make me sad as a career coach? I'm a pretty positive guy and I'm always looking for ways to help any job searcher that I'm working with. But when I hear these in an introductory conversation, there's just a bit of sadness that overcomes me in that I'm like, all right, I wish you would have avoided doing these things, or I wish you would have come and talked to me earlier, or I can understand your frustration, but it's because those aren't the most effective ways to do it. But some of them are the most obvious. So the two things are, the first one is, spending way too much time perfecting a resume. Um, a resume is definitely needed. And going back to one of the authors, Steve Dalton, he would use a metric of, if your job search is gonna take 100 hours to do, your resume should only take three hours of that 100 hours. And I think that's a pretty good sense of resumes, is something that many people, myself in the past included, were pursuing the perfect resume. The perfect resume really is hard to agree upon. Everybody looks for different things in a resume. So the only perfect resume, according to Dalton, would be one that is got you know no errors as far as grammar, formatting. After that, whatever you include, people are gonna disagree. So don't overthink the resume. Um, the other part that makes me sad is if I've heard someone say that they paid for a resume writer, because again, there's no perfect resume. And so if someone spends way too much time on a resume or spends way too much money on a resume, that makes me sad for them. Um, and finally, a lot of the chatter around the perfect resume is that what I like to call the ATS boogeyman. So applicant tracking system or those applicant systems that screen out people. Um, while I do think this continues to evolve with artificial intelligence and how resumes are reviewed by recruiters, I also think that it's a bit overblown. I think that there are plenty of recruiters, myself when I was a recruiter included, that look at every resume <clears throat> that goes into an application. Uh, that's not maybe true for every application, but I think that the concern about having the perfect resume that can beat the ATS or accepted by the ATS is a bit overblown. Um, and I also think there's plenty of workarounds to an ATS. So that's my first thing that makes me sad. The second thing that makes me sad is when I talk to someone and all they talk about is applying. They don't talk at all about the networking. 
They talk about doing hundreds of job applications. I always see something like this on LinkedIn. And they say, I've applied to so many jobs, but they haven't done any networking. Here's a screen grab. I know it's very blurry. Uh, this is this was a write-up from Newsweek about a TikTok that went viral about this student. And it was about an internship search specifically. But you can see on the left-hand side, he, in this very brief TikTok, uh, showed all 456 uh, companies that he was tracking. He had an excellent tracking system, which he actually has posted on his account so that you can use it if you want. Um, 56 interviews, which actually isn't too bad, uh, but all led to one internship. 456, and that's the horror story. I see plenty of the 456 or 1,000 without even one offer. Um, and he's he's posted plenty of follow-up uh, videos around this saying the, one of the number one things he wished he would have learned sooner was that he should have been networking, and this would have saved him a lot of headache here. Okay, so pointing to... I'll call him the godfather of the career books. Uh, Dick Bowles, he has passed away. It's almost seven years ago now, but he had cranked out this book every year for over 40 years, a new publication, What Color Is Your Parachute? Um, and this is a screen grab of the most recent edition of it. But he had this uh, upside down pyramid that I just... It blew my mind when I first came across this. And I, I share this in as many presentations as I possibly can. But this is basically a diagram of how hiring managers, how recruiters fill their roles. They start at the top of these. I'm going to go through all six of these methods. But the number one thing that they're doing is they look around and say, like, who can I promote into this opening? Who is already internally on my team? that uh, I can promote into a, if I have a job opening, is there anybody that can do it? And these are all about what is the most trustworthy way to fill a role. And he's got a lot of text. He's an excellent writer, um, a former minister, and just a um, excellent researcher as well. And so lots of implications in his book around this, each of these steps here. It's also on his website, which I have linked at the end, um, more details about this um, slide. The next way a hiring manager will go is if they can find some clear proof that the person can do the job. Uh, just as a, an example of what this means is, um, I, I went to, the first time I used this with a student after reading this was way back in my first job. It was with a student who was at a ministry school but wanted to go into um, the culinary arts, uh, become a baker specifically. I was like, he has no formal bake, baking training. He's not at culinary art school. And so I said, you know, one of the ways that you can prove you're a good baker is go to an employer, go to an interview and bring some cupcakes. His specialty was cupcakes. That's proof. The proof is in the pudding, they say, right? So think about, can you, without a doubt, show off your work? Now, a lot of us work in roles that aren't, don't have tangible outputs. And so we can't use this method um, and we don't work internally. So the next thing is a hiring manager, if they can't find someone that can prove that they can do the job or if they can promote, is they look for a referral from someone they trust. Is it someone internally, someone externally? Because the externally one would be the next one is, can they work with a headhunter, a staffing agency, a recruiter, someone that can say, yeah, I think this person would be a good fit for your opening. Trust me. If they can't fill it through any of those first four, they'll fill the role through a posting. They'll put a posting out there. They'll go through the applications. They'll see who applied. And then finally, you know, maybe any unsolicited resume that they got. But here's the kicker. It's the exact opposite method that a job seeker goes about getting into a role. Typically, the first thing a job seeker is going to do is they look at, how's my resume looking? Okay, I'm going to go look for job openings online. Okay, I haven't done so well. I've heard staffing agencies or headhunters can be helpful, and they are. I highly think that they are. Um, but it may be taking a while for them to get to that. And then finally, 
the one that most of us have access to is that, you know, third from the top option, because a lot of us are trying to get into a new company, can't prove that we can do the, you know, intellectual work that we do. Referral. Can we find someone who can be a referral source for us? And so I tried to fast track job seekers methods by getting them to think about how can I get into that referral phase as fast as possible? Okay, I wanna play around in the chat a little bit. I work at a school and do a lot of these presentations. So try to get engagement as much as possible. So if you are willing to in the chat, answer this question. So what percent of jobs are filled through an application? Someone just applies online through the job board. What percentage of jobs are filled through an application? Okay, thank you. Oh, I love seeing the chat explode. Can't even keep up with it. I'm gonna look back, scroll through, make my chat box just a little bit bigger. So I've seen, I see the high point here, 8% was the first one. And then I see 60 to 70, so that's the highest as low as less than 5%, 15, 15. Great, thanks everyone for playing along. Actually, I think of this in two different ways. So in, I haven't read Parachute in a while um, because it uh, hasn't been published since um, this last year. They didn't publish a new one. Um, hoping they'll publish one here in 2024, but uh, as of the last reading I had, it was less than 3% or about 3%. So I think someone said less than five. However, uh, Steve Dalton points to a very specific study. Um, so the author of the two hour job search, the job closer. So if anybody put, you know, somewhere around that 8%, what he uses is a study from the New York Fed, uh, Federal Reserve that um, looked at how it filled its roles. And it was one out of 13 was not a referral. 12 out of the 13 roles were from a referral. And so he says, if you want to keep going down that application route, great, fine. But you're playing the lottery ticket of trying to be that one in 13. And so I just want you to keep in mind that 8%, less than 8%, is 7.7% blah, 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 uh, decimal repeating, but one out of 13, less than 8%. Okay, so moving on to Steve, I've tried to put pictures in here just to remind you that this is not my work, this is their work. I'm, um, you know, really want to highlight this amazing book. Uh, and one of the things he starts out with in his introduction is about the defensive job search, the opposite of the two hour job search. And in the defensive job search, or the DJS, he uses so many acronyms in his book. Uh, the defensive job search is defined by these things. Effort metrics. Effort metrics being number of applications submitted, numbers of hours searching. Steve uses a lot of great examples of uh, behavioral psychology and applications submitted and numbers of hours searching, those are easy metrics to say, I'm putting in a lot of good work or I'm working hard on my job search. And so anytime that you apply, you get this gratification that you've applied. Anytime that someone says, oh, I see that you worked all weekend on job applications, way to go. You know, those are the types of things that those are rewarding this defensive job search of these effort metrics. What he and I as well want you to flip your mindset, switch that mindset towards success metrics. And the most impactful metric here is the number of informational interviews leading towards referrals or a number of networking meetings. I like to use the words informational interviews and networking meetings uh, as synonyms. I also like to use the word informational interviews a bit more because some people have um, negative connotation around networking. Uh, but 
informational interviews, grabbing information from individuals. And I think this quote from the book is so powerful. Um, so I'll read it here. So getting intern referrals is simply the only predictable way to get interviews. So getting them, so getting those intern referrals efficiently is the core challenge of the modern job search. So getting those referrals is the only way we can predict success in our um, way of getting interviews and getting these referrals efficiently is the most impactful way to do uh, your job search in an efficient, efficient way. Okay, so diving in, what is this? Has anybody, I'd be curious to know if anybody in the chat that's on today has read the two-hour job search. Um, there's a second edition that was published in um, April, 2020. So I'm guessing most of it was written pre-pandemic. Uh, I actually did reach out to Steve. He was like, hey, we're going to buy more editions of these in our office for our students and alumni. Are you thinking about writing a third edition? I mean, 2020 is a lifetime ago and yet not that long ago. And he said, no, probably not anytime soon. Jo book's doing quite well. Um, but he did give me some insights that I've included this on some of the updates he would make. And now thinking how AI has revolutionized the job search in the last year and a half, I'm sure the next edition of his will be overhauled with more tips around AI. Um, so the two-hour job search is broken into three parts. And actually for the third part, I'm going to go away from his book and refer to the 20-minute networking meeting book. But the third part is about informational interviews. So the first two parts, and this is where the name the two-hour job search comes from, is 70 minutes dedicated to part one and 50 minutes dedicated to part two. And this is setting up your job search. So it's not that the job search in its totality is only two hours. Um, it's that setting up an effective job search. If you're focused on each of these steps, that it should take you 70 plus 50, 120 minutes to set up your job search for those two hours. Let's dig into it. Oh, before we dig into it, I do want to do one activity. So this will be a 60-second activity. You're doing it on your own. Um, but what I want you to do is whether on a piece of paper, type it into your phone, or type it into your um, computer, is I want you to, in one minute, type out or write down as many employers of interest to you in one minute. So a couple of tips before I start my timer here is don't worry about the practicality of the employer. If you're like, I want to go work for Disney, um, but have no plans to relocate, that's okay. Still add it to your list. There are no limits to the most practicality of these employers. So the activity again is just simply write down or type out as many employers of interest not just any employers, but employers that are in, of interest to you in one minute. Okay, get my timer started here and go. Okay, based on my timer, we're about halfway through. See how many more employers you can get. Final 30 seconds. Okay, my kids play a game where we try to see if we can stop this stopwatch on my phone at a certain interesting number. I got one minute, but 
0.42 of an extra second. So I wasn't exactly right on it. But anyway, think for a second, was that easy? Was that hard? Um, feel free to add comments about what your experience was like in the chat. Or um, if you want to show off a little bit, there's no um, good or bad here. This is an activity you didn't know you were going to be doing today, but I'd love to know how many employers were you able to come up with in your 60 seconds and the extra 42 of a second. Okay. So this is the a screenshot of his um, lampless template on his website. So he's got a great website that has a couple of resources. Um, and this is one of them that you can download. You can create your own version of this. I prefer Google Docs or Google Sheets, I should say. Um, but this is what it looks like, a screen grab of his. And I have linked here um, where you can grab that. So lamp list, two-hour job search, four basic columns plus a numbering column. But this is something you can download or create yourself. Oh, cool. Thanks for sharing, those of you who added 10, 12. I bet there was people that had less. There may be people who had more, but good job. Thanks for playing along. So for this, there are four steps in 70 minutes for the first part of the book. Basically, you are spending it allocated in this way. Spend 40 minutes listing out employers. 10 minutes searching for advocates. I'll talk more about what that means. Five minutes ranking your motivation for each employer. And then 15 minutes searching to see, do they have a posting up, yes or no? Um, I like to add in a fifth step here. So I, I say that it's untimed, but there's some sorting that goes on and I'll talk more about how that filtering works. So for this first part, the prioritizing of companies is 70 minutes in total. So if for any of you who got 10 uh, employers or more in that time, you're already off to a great start for this. So I'll go through each of these using the title of L is for, <laughs> L is for list. So L is for lists. So the first thing is the longest part of this. It's 40 minutes. And the 40 minutes is actually broken into 10 four-minute chunks. So I gave you a minute to just brainstorm data dump as quickly as possible, but he breaks it into spending 10 minutes on each of these four types. So 10 minutes about dream employers. So maybe that's mainly what you just came up with, but 10 minutes on dream employers and minutes on affinity employers. In the first edition of this book, there is, um, it was this, the A was alumni. And Steve is a career coach or was a career coach at Duke's Fuqua, basically the Carlson of um, Carolina. And so he works a similar population. Um, so he used to really leverage the alumni. I know not all of you have a strong alumni network or have gone to school and built alumni, but there are lots of other advocates that you can find in other spaces that are relevant to you. So affinity, so affinity employers, actively hiring. Basically, do they have a job posting up or not? Do, are they on a hiring freeze? Um, yeah, kudos to Virginia for uh, adding that link. That is great. Um, trending employers. Um, and so trending employers, employers that are showing up in your searches, showing up in your conversation, showing up in places where you're interested in learning more. So spend 10 minutes on each type. I have a few tips here as well. So 40 minute, 40 employers is the minimum, but 100 employers is the max. If it gets over 100 employers, well, you can go over the 40 minimum. You don't want to get over 100. It just becomes too difficult to manage. Um, 10 minutes or 10 employers, whichever comes first. So if you, for one section, can come up with 20 dream employers, but uh, trending employers, you're like, I have three. That's fine, because you just want to get to that minimum of 40. The first 25 are typically easy to come up with. It's the last 15 that can be hard. Your aim here is for good and not perfect. You don't need to have the perfect list. And then 
one of the things he talks a lot about is these, um, all of the things that you need to do, just stay on focus so that you get through this within the 40 minute time and you do everything within the 10 minute time frame. So stay in focus. If you see an interesting uh, application somewhere and you're like, oh, I'll take a 15 minute break to apply and then I'll come back to this. No, once you go through this two hour job search process, then you are all set to go back and circle around and apply should that still be one of your top employers. Okay, so another play along at home, add into the chat. I when every time I have one of these non gray colored screens or a dark bluish gray color screen, these lighter ones, I want to have uh, see what you think. So this question here is what percentage of employers have fewer than 100 employees? What do you think? What percentage, just throw a number in, what percentage of employers have fewer than 100 employees? Great, I love to see the chat waterfall going. I think the first one, oh, well, first one I came up with was Sarah is 75, it's a great opening guess. So that's, let's see, 80 is the high I'm seeing. Oh, 95, 85. And so the low guess was 40. So we got a range of 40 to 95. Michael, ding, ding, ding. I believe you're about as close as we're going to see here. Let's see, I have some animation. Let's go. Okay. So Steve used data from 2018. So this may have changed uh, a bit, but, um, but break down in his book that the number, the percentage of employers that have fewer than 100 employees, 98.7%. So that means that if you're only applying to big, well-known companies, you're only applying to roles at the... 1.3% of employers out there. So when you were thinking about the company names, did you think of companies that were under 100? Maybe, maybe not. But there is lots of opportunity to expand your list of employers, as well as these lesser known employers are often less competitive to get jobs at. Thanks for playing along, everyone. Okay, so A is for advocate. Uh, the second letter in the LAMP acronym is actions. Search for advocates at each company listed. Um, and then simply all you do is mark yes or no. So what is an advocate? Again, I mentioned earlier about alumni, and this is uh, possibly easy if you're a recent student or you have a strong alumni network. Um, however, advocates could be you served in the military. You um, are part of a similar LinkedIn group because of some sort of professional association. It could be hobbies. It could be a number of things that you have a shared interest, experience, expertise in. There are thousands, maybe even millions of groups on LinkedIn and there are lots of ways that you can find a group on LinkedIn or other social groups that you can say, where are my advocates? So this, you're simply just writing yes or no. I think LinkedIn is the easiest way to do this. So going on to LinkedIn and searching for an advocate, quickly saying, if at my first company, Meditech, I see that there's an alum or I see someone who I have a first degree connection or some other person there that I can start with, I put yes. If I know no one there, there's no alums that show up there, I can't find anybody that has a shared affinity. So like number two here, I put no. And simply just go through this within 10 minutes, quickly searching. Don't do too deep of a dive to see yes or who those people are, but trying to fill this out as yes, no's. Okay, M is for motivation, third step. You want to give each employer a motivation score. And the score is on a ranking of zero to three. So you see the scaling here. So your top tier employees will get a three, middle tier, lower tier, but also note that you would put a zero in. Zero is for 
and this is important for the filtering of the Excel sheet or sheet that you're using, is I just don't know enough right now because we're going to come back to those people. You don't need to research them now. It's just based on what you know about the company now. How motivated are you to go after this company? You may search and find a bunch of companies from best employers in the Twin Cities and then dump all of those names into your L column. But you might not know a lot about them. So you might have to put zero or you may know enough to say it's a one. So this should be just a quick, this company name, what am I interested in? And then move that into um, the motivation score of three, two, one, or zero. P, this is our final column here before we start sorting. P is for posting. So you're going to do two searches and this one's a little bit longer. This one's a 15 minute. Um, so the second most time dedicated to this is you're potentially going to do two searches here. The first search is for relevant postings. And I use the example of brand manager here. So let's say that you're interested in a brand manager. So you go to that company, um, they're actually back that up. That's one way you can do it. Um, you see the Indeed logo here. Uh, Steve would recommend Indeed as the biggest, broadest, most catch capturing of all job postings, job board. You can use your other preferred job board. Uh, I, I think Indeed is just fine. Um, I used to recommend LinkedIn mainly, but they have changed the way that they post jobs now. And so I don't think it's as good at catching all jobs. Um, so first, what you want to do is you want to search for relevant postings, same job title um, that you're looking for. Second, if no relevant posting shows up, then you're going to search for related postings, related positions. So Maybe it's not brand manager, but they have, they're have they hiring other marketing functions. And so you search for marketing jobs. And if they have something, then you look at the scaling here. So if at least one ideal posting, so in this case, a brand manager job is currently posted, then you put a three into the posting column. If at least one of the semi-relevant or the related postings is found, then you would put in a two. And for this scaling, there's no zero. This one is simply if there are no semi-relevant. So you do that second search for marketing, any type of marketing, they have nothing posted in marketing, then you would put a one in that column. Again, we want to limit this to about 15 minutes of time. We don't want to click on these postings. We don't want to apply these postings. We want to learn more. We don't necessarily even want to save them. We simply just want to see yes or no. Do they have these postings and score them? Okay, so this is the additional part. This isn't explicitly listed as a separate step in the book, but it is talked about on the filtering. Because basically what we're going to do is, and I, I don't think I mentioned this from the outset, but our goal is to come up with a top six companies. And if you have read this book, or if you do end up buying this book or listening to this book or checking this book out from the library, which again, I highly recommend, uh, you'll see that it's written as top five, filtering down to a top five. However, over email correspondence, so you're hearing it here first, before the third edition of this book comes out, he, Steve says that during the pandemic, some of the things that have changed and um, impacted is trying to get um, a top six instead of a top five. So what I would recommend here is following this strategy here of a top five a top six rather than what the book says of a top five. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to sort. You're going to sort by motivation column. This is Excel, a, a image of an Excel filtering. But go into your Excel, do your sorting, sort by motivation, then sort by the posting column, and then finally filter by advocate. So you filter, first filter, add a second filter, Second filter is postings, add a third filter, third filter is sorting by advocate. Once you see that, you see those scores, what I want you to do is I want you to then look at your top six. Who, which are the top six? 
Steve then recommends, okay, these are your six companies you're going to use, but look at number seven. Before we move on and start contacting these six companies, how do you feel about your seventh? And if you wish your number seven was in your top six, one of the ones that you're starting with and not one on your come back to later list, then change the scores and resort until you're happy with your list. So that is the first part of this is fill out your list, filter it. You've got a top six list of companies. These should be the main six companies that you focus on for step two. Part two is identifying and messaging advocates. So this, we've got our list of six targeted companies. Now we still got to start identifying who we're going to reach out to and start messaging them. So in summary, this is the second half, essentially, of the two hours. Um, it's 50 of those 120 minutes. And you are going to spend each amount of time on these steps. So 20 minutes of naturalizing, 20 minutes on writing this email and sending it, and then 20 minutes on the track, or 10 minutes on the tracking step. So what does that include? Well, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find these three types of people. You're going to look for two contacts at each of your top six companies, and you're going to eventually figure out, are they a booster? Are they an obligate? Or are they a curmudgeon? So Steve really likes boosters and curmudgeons, but he detests obligates. So a booster is going to be someone who wants to help. They're going to help naturally. And a curmudgeon is going to be someone who doesn't respond. And he likes that person because he's all about time efficiency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the other one that he is uh, yeah. not a fan of, the obligate, is someone who will kind of lead you along. Someone who will... Um, someone who will say, oh, yeah, let's meet, and then reschedules last minute. Something to that effect. So naturalizing, what does it mean by naturalizing? So in this 2HJS, 2 our job search, that means to identify and find contact information for potential advocates who are most likely to help us gain admittance into their professional network, page 85. So two starter contacts at each of your top, oh, that should say six, your top six companies. I created this deck for students previously before I corresponded with Steve over email. Um, he's got what kind of traits to look for, what types of resources for finding and messaging these contacts. And so for sake of time, I won't go through each of these, but I highly recommend that you read this chapter as you think, who are those two people that I should start with? Now, there's lots of advice on writing a um, outreach, a cold outreach email, or even a warm or a recommended person you outreach to. And Steve, he's very adamant that think about your audience and think about how you receive these kind of similar requests. And he surprisingly would say, do less than 75 words. His previous edition of the book, first edition, I think said 100 words. But even then, he said it got to be too long. So you're writing your ask. Your ask is for insight and advice to me. But don't go into everything about you. Number six, point number six is important to say. And then you've got an example here is, but keep over half the word count about the connection and not about you. It's not... Hey, I got, went to this school. I've worked in this space. I'm interested in this type of work. No, no, no. Just say, I'm interested in who you are. Oh my gosh, you are the cutest. I think what there's someone that needs to mute. Is there someone that can needs to mute? Okay. Um, not, not about yourself. And you can see an example here. Just talk about shared affinity talk about what you're interested in and what you want. You want to have a brief conversation and that's it. If they're going to naturally say yes and be a booster, they're going to say yes. 
if they're going to ignore you, they're going to ignore your request for help. And if they're going to be someone who strings you along, hopefully we don't catch those people, but uh, they'll reveal their true nature as they reschedule on you or eventually cancel. Okay, so next, play along at home. What percentage of contacts respond to a six-point email? What do you think? What percentage of contacts respond to a six-point email? Thomas got us started here, 85%. Rochelle was 60%, 33%, 5 80, 65, 50. Oh, there's this one's kind of got a bigger range here. A little all over the board, 8%, 75. All right, keep those coming in as I reveal the answer. Okay, this is going to be maybe a bit of a deep cut. I don't know the audience and their sports ball knowledge, but if you've heard of the Mendoza line in baseball, Mendoza line is named after this light hitting player, Mario Mendoza, who flirted with around 200 batting average. If you're a baseball savant and you know that, you know, a good batting average is closer to 300 than it is to 200. The reason I use baseball and I don't, you know, maybe love all sports analogies, but the reason I use baseball is if you hit about 30%, you're doing amazing. You're paid millions of dollars. Where else in life are, do you succeed when you are, uh, are succeeding only about 30% of the time at something? And the reason to, this is such a good example is to reframe. No one thinks like, oh man, that baseball player that only hits 300 is he's failing 70% of the time. No, they think, wow, what a great hitter. Now, in Steve's book, it said 20 to 40% of the time. So anybody who was in that range, 20 to 40%, you're partially right. And they say partially is because, again, as I was corresponding with Steve, he said that the new post-COVID response rate that he's seen is lower, unfortunately lower, 10 to 20%. And so now the Mendoza line or that 200 batting average, which is the same as 20%, is awesome is what you're hoping for 20 percent of the time well that sounds terrible why why 20 percent of the time well people are busy there's obligates and curmudgeons out there that aren't going to get back to you so i want you to reframe this he uses the words contacts rather than people because it's you think of it as a bit more of an asset or a sales lead you don't necessarily need to be like, why aren't these people getting back to me? Just keep in mind that the 10 to 20% of the people that do are going to be your best friends, are going to be the people that help that supercharge your job search. But realize that it's not going to be these huge numbers um, that we saw in the chat. So reframe. Okay, and the final thing, and this is so much better detailed in the book. So I highly recommend that you buy a copy or check it out and read through this chapter about the 3B7 routine. Um, Steve's got amazing examples. And this one I think is super helpful for tracking. So you may say, yes, I know I need to track my outreach, but here is a very specific method that he reached, uh, recommends. So 3B7, the 3B7 tracking method, B standing for business days. So for example, let's say that you sent out a message today, Thursday. Then you would go three days out, three business days. So Friday, Monday, Tuesday. You set yourself a reminder for that day to then reach out and say, I haven't heard back from this person. I'm going to reach out to my second contact. And that's why we have those two contacts. And you set up another 3B7 reminder system. Seven days, that's when you follow up with the first person that you reached out to. If you still haven't heard back from that first person within seven business days, then you send them one reminder. And if they don't respond after that, 
you move on. They're likely uh, curmudgeon, maybe a slow moving obligate, but move on. There's no harm in reaching out to another contact. You do the same thing with the second contact, 3B7. And if neither of the first two, then you source more contacts at that company. It's only after you've continued to reach out using the six point email and tracking with the 3B7 uh, tracking that you then take this top company out of your top six and move on to number seven in your list. And with that, I've covered everything that I'm going to cover today in Steve Dalton's book and move on to two of friends of Minnesota and the job search, Marsha Ballinger and Nathan Perez. Uh, I believe they both presented. I think Marsha's on the docket to present to this group here relatively soon. Um, but this fantastic book, the 20 minute networking meeting book, the book that I recommend the most. While Steve's book does highlight networking meetings, I'm going to make a joke here, but we're talking about smarter, not harder today. This 20 minute networking meeting versus Steve's 30 minute uh, method, which he uses a framework called the tiara questions. I think it's a great method as well. And if you have used the 20 minute networking meeting and it hasn't worked for you, or you don't like the 20 minutes, sure, check out Steve's 30 minute. I think it's very similar, lots of good overlap there. But for working smarter, not harder, let's save ourselves some time here and use the 20 minute, the five questions in the 20 minute networking meeting. Here's a snapshot of this book. And what I love about this book is they have an amazing appendix. The authors have put together such a fantastic appendix in this book. I think that's worth its weight in and of itself. Also, uh, this book is about half as long on audiobook. It's about three and a half hours as opposed to Steve's book, about seven hours of audio listening. Um, you can really churn through this one pretty quickly. So these are the steps in the 20 minute networking meeting. I'd be curious in the chat how many people have read this one. I bet more people have read this one than the two hour job search. I don't think I saw anybody said that they'd read this one. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't surprised. Thanks, Gina, Thomas. Yes, good. So I highly recommend this as a way to structure. If you haven't read it yet, look at the people in the chat and see that they've done it. And I've recommended it to hundreds. Um, such a great structure. Yes, exactly, Becky. Thank you. So you see the time amount that's taken here. You see what you do. You see the bulk of it, this three uh, great discussion portion, part three. So I'll highlight that. Um, I put in here four to five questions rather than five questions. Hard. Now, this is where I disagree with the authors on the style or format of the fifth question, the how can I help you? Um, when I've been asked by that, I found it to be um, uncomfortable, awkward. And so if you are wanting to ask that, great. I think uh, the authors make a strong case for why to use that fifth question. Um, Steve Dalton would disagree and he has got a great example about asking for help versus um, uh, you know, offering or bartering for the help that you're looking for. And so I think he makes a strong case for not using a how can I help you question. But I do strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you use the same, you know, four questions that they recommend, those three observation related questions, and then the asking for other contacts. I think that's fantastic. That's another divergence from the two methods. Steve um, doesn't have a recommendation that you have a hard ask for other contacts in the moment. He uh, actually has kind of a follow-up method that he recommends there. So another divergence between the two systems here. Um, but yes, then the two minutes for the ending and then your follow-up step that's outside of these 20 minutes. But just such a great structure. I highly recommend that you check out by, this is a go-to book for sure. So the thing that I feel that I don't necessarily address in this presentation, 
and in most of my networking pre presentations, they're more of a how-to. And how-tos are very important. But it's kind of, I think of this similar to New Year's resolutions or eating healthy and working out. In that we know we should do those things. As well, we know when job searching, networking is known to be more effective. We know we should be doing them, but there's barriers to do it. I did a presentation with one of my colleagues um, earlier this year about networking in the new year and how do you um, address those barriers or those myths to networking. And so I'd be happy to talk with you one-on-one -on -one later about that um, if you'd like, but the book, which is great, has a section, the 20 minute networking book has a section on myths and bust those myths essentially. And so I really recommend reading that, paying close attention to that so that you can reframe anything that's preventing you from networking. But I can't go into the depth of that today. The other thing I would love to do if I had endless amounts of time is cover all the other things that are related to this. Today was simply about networking and job searching in the most effective ways, not the most time consuming ways. But there are things that you may also be considering. So I got a couple of extra book recommendations here too. So the first one is are you actually feeling ready to network? Are you like, I know I should do it, and now I know how to do it, but I don't really feel ready to do it. Fine, like I said, the appendix in the 20 minute networking meeting book is awesome in that it has a readiness assessment. I highly recommend you go through the readiness assessment um, to see those answers and feel much more ready to know what you're gonna talk about. You may say, well, I came here today to learn effective ways to search, but I actually don't quite know what I'm searching for. So do you know what you want to do? If not, I recommend these two books here and I haven't talked about the Designing Your Life. They have a similar book, Designing Your Work Life, um, which I haven't read fully. I've listened to about half of it so far. Um, and they're definitely different enough that you might be interested in both. But Designing Your Life, I think, is uh, more widely available, so you can probably get it cheaper at any library. And it does exactly what you need to do here. Um, but in What Color Is Your Parachute, Bowles has this great um, flower exercise. And there's workbooks as well that you can probably find as well that are related to the flower exercise. But I think it's a great exercise. In Designing Your Life, there's a couple of exercises, and you can find YouTube playlists about Odyssey planning. Odyssey planning and prototyping, it's basically applying design thinking to your career exploration and your life planning. And so though, a couple other books that I, I recommend a lot to um, job seekers. And then are you like, well, okay, now I know these things, but I need help with other parts. The, resumes, the interviews, the negotiation. I mentioned this earlier briefly, but the Steve's latest book, The Job Closer, I think also has really, really tactical advice. So he's a, I think started as a chemical engineer. So he's got a very engineering approach to things um, before he went to business school and then became a career coach. But resume writing, interviewing, negotiations, and other related points, that book is a really, really good text as well. Um, So with that, uh, those are my recommendations. I have some other resources here that I recommend. Um, the different books are linked here, as well as um, the LinkedIn group for, uh, for Dalton's book is fantastic. He engages with everybody in there. Um, so join his two-hour job search and the job closer Q&A forum and pose any questions you might have about the book. Uh, he and another colleague uh, did a two-hour job search plus networking in the age of AI. And so that's a fantastic webinar recording that can give you how can AI supercharge your lamp list creation. Um, I also linked to Dick Bowles' outdated but still a great um, 
archive of all his resources there at the bottom, the Job Hunters Bible. Um, hopefully that job, hopefully that site lists forever because it's just such a great uh, website for this leader. And then finally, um, the third bullet point example videos by one of the authors of the 20 minute networking meeting, Nathan A. Perez. Uh, it's cool to see that lived out if you haven't um, actually applied it yourself. Okay. And so with that, uh, that concludes my presentation today. Well, thanks so much. You know, as you were speaking, there was uh, so much I resonate with. Um, for people that don't know, I've been a recruiter for over 36 years. And and uh, you know, in that role, you kind of get a unique window into how things work. I'm talking to employers all the time. I'm talking to people that are looking for jobs and hear what works, what doesn't, what the processes are. And there's so many things that you said that are, are just so spot on. I, I appreciate when uh, you... Um, give that kind of advice. And it's very practical. You laid out steps of people to, for people to be able to think about and follow. And I think uh, the more people actually apply these things, the the better it is. You know, you can talk about uh, and, and learn all kinds of great techniques and everything, but it's only what you apply that really makes a difference in your search, right? And I'm sure you find uh, that challenge with many of the people that you work with at the University of Minnesota as well. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Thanks, Harry. Well, thanks so much for your time and, and uh, expertise on this. And I hope it was uh, very worthwhile for everybody involved. If you uh, all can just hang on for just a couple of minutes, I want to run through quickly all the other things we have available for you through Crossroads so that you can take advantage of all that. And we have a special event coming up that uh, I think uh, uh, is going to be worthwhile for many of you. I know some of you online right now are from out of town and so out of outside the Twin Cities. So uh, we the in-person events we have aren't as uh, useful for you, obviously, but hopefully uh, you can take advantage of other things as well. Let me share my screen here and I'll run through a number of things. Hang on. Okay, if this is your first time on one of our webinars, we will, you will be receiving in the mail one of these uh, devotionals. It's a free gift from us. It's uh, how long, oh Lord, how long. There's a great index in the back to really look up, you know, what am I struggling with in my job search right now? And uh, whether it's practical matters, tactical matters, or or emotional struggles in this process. And and there's some great uh, devotionals and, and thoughts on all kinds of different subjects. And I hope it's uh inspiring and encouraging and worthwhile for you. So I appreciate that Becky, she's putting in that she's received it and that it's uh, been a great gift of support. I'm glad to hear that. And I hope uh, it is for others as well. Um, everything that we offer through Crossroads, you can find on our website at mncrossroads.com. And you can find events, schedules, resources, um, and all the uh, details of how to take part in everything. We also do have a job board. There are a number of local employers that know what we do, know that great people um, uh, attend and, and uh, participate in Crossroads and they're looking for you. So there's all kinds of job postings on there. It's not as populated as indeed.com or LinkedIn for sure, but um, they are great positions in all kinds of different industries and career backgrounds. And in many cases, they post uh, contact information so you can reach out and ask questions and talk to somebody instead of just applying to a black hole. So check it out regularly. There's new postings that go up every week and, and uh, hopefully you can find something there that uh, makes sense. And when you do reach out or apply, make sure that you mention that you found out about it through Crossroads and that'll encourage them to use the job board even more. Our kind of regular cadence throughout the month in terms of what we offer is um, the first Thursday morning of each month, we meet in person at Grace Church in Eden Prairie. And uh, we have a seminar presentation like this, um, but actually get to see people face to face and have side conversations and being able to connect with others, I think is a great help in this process as well. Immediately following that uh, first Thursday meeting is our networking with Grace Group. I'll touch on that again here in a little bit and to describe what that is, but it's a chance to do more intense networking, to trade contacts and get leads and, 
and uh, companies that uh, would be of interest to you. On the second Thursday evening of each month, we meet at Woodbury Lutheran Church for a presentation there as well. And then the first, or excuse me, third Thursday morning uh, is our online webinar presentation, which you're on right now. So take part in as many of these as you can throughout the month and uh, on the upcoming topics and speakers and information on how to uh, participate is all on our website uh, for details. You can find it, all the information there. On a weekly basis, there's other ways you can participate. As I mentioned, the Networking with Grace group meets every Thursday, first Thursday in person at Grace Church, and all the other Thursdays are online through Zoom meetings instead of a Zoom webinar like this where you don't get to see each other. They meet on a Zoom meeting so you can see each other. But uh, it's a great way to get contacts and leads and, and just encouragement from others that are in the same boat. I encourage you to uh, take part in that as often as you can. and. Uh, get some help along the way there. Wes Tang leads that. And he, I think he does a great job of trying to make sure everybody walks out with something each week. And uh, at the very least, like I said, getting some hope and encouragement in the process can uh, do nothing but good. We have one-on-one -on -one coaching available. If you'd like to talk to one of our volunteers, uh, you can sign up on the form on our website and somebody will reach out to you to find a time for a Zoom meeting or a phone call. And you can talk about anything that you have questions about in your job search, whether it's to look at your resume and offer some improvements, um, whether it's uh, uh, to prepare for an upcoming interview. Maybe you want to do mock interview uh, practice questions with someone. Um, perhaps you just want to talk through your situation and, and get some fresh input and ideas with somebody that gets it. And uh, you can certainly take advantage of that as often as you like. And so sign up on the uh, form on the website for one-on-one -on -one coaching. And you can, uh, like I say, hear from one of our volunteers soon. As you may have already experienced, this uh, process can be an emotional roller coaster, right? And there's ups and downs, and it can be draining for a lot of people or, or a tough process. And so we have, I'm grateful, uh, people on our team that are just love to pray for you. And so they pray for the group regularly. But if you have individual prayer requests, go on our website to our prayer request page, fill in the information there, and uh, somebody will let you know that they're praying for you specifically. If in addition to that, if you feel like you're discouraged or just really struggling through this and want to talk to somebody more regularly, you can sign up for our soul care team who will reach out to you and set up times that uh, the two of you can talk about uh, just the emotional journey you go through in this process. The meat and potatoes and where I think you can get the most in-depth help is through our online classes. Uh, we have small group classes that start, a new one starts each month. And we have one coming up starting uh, April 2nd, which I believe is Monday or Tuesday next week. I can't remember, recall, or in two weeks. I can't recall exactly what day it is. But uh, um, in any case, the class covers every aspect of a job search, starting with attitude and getting in the right frame of mind. You know what? I, oh, never mind. I'm good. I wasn't sure I was sharing my screen, but I am. Um, in any case, uh, getting in the right frame of mind, we have some assessments so you can articulate better what makes you unique and really do some. Uh, self-assessment to figure out what is important to me and what are the things that uh, uh, matter most in my next job and that I want to do or things I don't want to do. And knowing those, you can ask better questions. Uh, we talk a lot about networking and targeting companies, some of which uh, Will touched on today, but we go into depth there too, how about its importance and how to do it effectively. Um, we uh, talk about resumes. You know, Will mentioned a great point, which I fully agree with that, uh, too often people get so wrapped up in trying to create the perfect resume. And while I'm a believer in having a good resume, the reality is you're never going to be able to write a resume that's going to dramatically change your, your results. It's uh, the networking will, the resume won't. And so certainly you want to have an effective resume and there's best practices we talk about and uh, everything else. But uh, I think don't get too hung up on trying to create the perfect one. And as soon as you think you have the perfect one, somebody else is going to shoot it down and you're going to be uh, thinking you have to redo it again. And so you don't have to take everybody's advice on those things. Uh, we talk about interviewing and what you find in the uh, 
uh, interview process and how things have changed today versus uh, what may be, may have happened, uh, um, you know, years ago. And uh, we talked about negotiating and selecting the right job and so much more. And as much as the content is really strong and I think can really give you more confidence in what you're doing each week in your job search, I think equally important is that light accountability, the uh, coming together with others that are in the same boat, getting encouragement and hope, hope for the next week and kind of getting your your uh, attitude back up to that even keel so that you're prepared to uh, attack the next week with a uh, more a better outlook. And throughout the eight week, we explore what God's perspective is on your job search and your life as well, because I think uh, that's ultimately the bigger question. You Certainly your job is critically important. We all have bills to pay and we want to be fulfilled in how we spend our day and, and add value to the world. But uh, I think understanding how God thinks about of your career and your life is critically important here. And so we cover that as well. So as I mentioned, we have new online classes beginning monthly. There's a new one starting April 2nd, which Braden, or excuse me, Michael Hurley will be leading that. You can find the details on the website and uh, register there to participate in that group. Coming up, um, we typically have done these on a quarterly basis, and we're going to get back to doing them on a quarterly basis again, but uh, we haven't done one in quite a while now. And so I encourage you to take advantage of this. We have a full day job search workshop coming up. It's going to be on Saturday, April 13th from eight to five and uh, in person at Grace Church in Eden Prairie. It's the one thing we charge for. Everything else is free, but uh, we do charge $15 for this. We do provide a box lunch for you uh, during the day and uh workbook with uh, course materials for the, all the things that we cover. But we have a number of topics. We, it's kind of uh, um, getting a boot camp and how to do an effective job search. And it you definitely will come out of that with some new perspectives, fresh ideas, some new encouragement of uh, how you can attack your job search more effectively and more productively throughout the week. So there is a uh, um, registration on the website. Really encourage you to take advantage of this. This is something like say we only do once a quarter and uh, it does take a day out of your weekend, but uh, it, I guarantee you'll be, uh, you'll find it worthwhile. If you go to the website where you find the registration for this, you're going to find uh, um, testimonials of other people that have been through it. And, and uh, I, I guarantee you're going to enjoy it. It's going to be um not a boring day. I don't think you're going to fall asleep. We have a number of different speakers that come in on different topics that know what they're talking about. And I really encourage you to take it advantage of it. Um, we have a LinkedIn group, which I really encourage you to take advantage of. There are over 2,500 people that are in it, all people that uh, have participated in uh, crossroads either currently or sometime in the past. And the ones that have been through it in the past that have decided to stay in the group are making themselves available just to be uh, contacts at the organizations they're working at now. So you can scroll through the membership and look for people that are working at companies that you might be tar targeting for yourself and find a friendly person to reach out to, to provide any advice or insight into pursuing opportunities there. And then when you land at a new position, I encourage you to stay in. And it's a great way to be able to give back and help others that uh, are, are pursuing opportunities at the company you're at as well. So check it out. There's a bunch of great information that gets posted in there as well, including upcoming events and other uh, articles and things that people post about uh, job search. And so take advantage of the LinkedIn group and check it out regularly. Uh, I mentioned in the chat earlier, but this webinar and all of our previous webinars from the last few years are posted on our YouTube channel. And if you just put MN Crossroads Career Network in the search box on YouTube, you'll find us. And uh, there are dozens of webinars that we've accumulated over the last few years and encourage you to check out different topics that are important to you and helpful. And it's a way to uh, get some great information. And who knows, maybe uh, Skip Nelson, who uh, often does these um, overviews of Crossroads, who talks about get uh, your significant other and curl up on a couch on a Friday night and watch job search videos with a bucket of popcorn. So if you're looking for a new form of entertainment, this might be it for you. <laughs> but uh, check out the different uh, topics there. And this uh, webinar today will get posted on there before the end of the day today. 
I just want to acknowledge we have actually over 45 people now that volunteer for Crossroads in one way or another, and I'm grateful for every one of them. Uh, many of them are coaches. Many of them do presentations for our workshops uh, and other uh, things that we do. We have uh, a number of different ways people serve to help us do all the different things we do. Nobody's getting a paycheck. Everybody does it because they want to share their expertise and knowledge and heart to help others in one way or another. So I'm just grateful for all the ways that they participate. Um, if you don't have a church home, uh, visit uh, Grace Church in Eden Prairie or Woodbury Lutheran, both who align with Crossroads, and uh, they have in-person services on Sunday mornings as well as streaming online. You can check it out. I encourage you to get involved in a church community and be able to uh, get the moral support, the teaching and input that uh, will help you in your life beyond just your job search. Our next presentation is coming up this coming, or excuse me, the first Thursday of uh, morning of April, so April 4th. The details are on the website, but Marsha Bollinger, who is one of the co-authors for the 20-minute networking meeting, will be talking about another book that she wrote called Making the Jump to Nonprofit. If nonprofit uh, uh organizations are on your radar screen, something perhaps you want to do, or maybe just to explore as another avenue that you may not have considered. This is definitely a presentation you want to come to. Marsha is in, very engaging um, to the point that she doesn't use uh, PowerPoint slides. She's just a great speaker and very um, direct and, and uh, uh, thoughtful and very practical. And so check this out. April 4th, you can find the details on the website and encourage you to join us there. So that's it for this morning. I hope it was worthwhile for you. Our networking group is meeting starting now. You do need to register online if you haven't already, but certainly take advantage of that if you still want to today, or you can jump in next week on that. And I'm glad you were able to be here. Hope it was a great morning for you. Have a great weekend and hope to see you at our other events. Take care.